Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 29, Justinian's Plague. As if an act of God prevented Justinian from uniting the Roman Empire, a plague spread throughout the land. Anyone living today has no idea what horrors a plague can bestow upon a society. In the year 541, a strange flu started to infect a sailor. In this era, it was common for people to get sick, and nothing was thought unusual from the event. This person was a sailor who traveled between ports in the Mediterranean Sea. Trade between the various ports of Egypt, Libya, Sicily, Morocco, Spain, France, Greece, and Constantinople. If you haven't noticed, I am listing off the names of every port I can think of, because the trade network of the era was vast, and merchant ships would travel as far west as the British Isles and as far east as India and China. The Roman Empire's greatest legacy was its economic trade. This trade allowed a silk trader from Persia to influence the life of a merchant in London. For hundreds of years, this trade went about, and the empire flourished because of it. In 540 CE, something changed. For some reason, a disease from Central Africa, a disease that had never been able to make its way into Europe, found its way north. There are many theories why this virus made its way north now and not before. One hypothesis suggests the trade network of the Roman Empire brought merchants into contact with this virus, and others suggest that the summers were very mild in the mid-6th century, allowing the disease to make its way out of Africa and infect the trading vessels of the Mediterranean. It is very important to discuss exactly what this plague was. Yersinia pestis, the Latin name for the plague, was a virus that lived within the gut of a flea that lived in the fur of the common black rat. This virus evolved in a most cynical way. The virus blocked the ability of the flea to digest the blood it ate from its host, and this forced the flea to bite and eat as much as it could, spreading the virus from the flea to the rats. When all of the rats died, the fleas were forced to get blood from human hosts. This plague is an example of evolution working itself into overdrive. In many environments, this plague would kill itself off after destroying all of its hosts. But something allowed this devastating virus to spread farther than ever before. The virus started in Egypt, which was the breadbasket of the empire. Thousands of ships carried grain from the Nile to the rest of the empire, And the grain ships from Egypt carried the contaminated rats from port to port, spreading the infectious disease. At first, the only symptoms were dock workers suffering from a common flu, but very quickly the symptoms increased. Large sacks of black blood pooled in the crotch and armpit of the plague victims. The disease was so efficient that it spread before anyone detected the first symptoms. At first, it was the sailors who fell ill. Then it was the merchants, and after that it was the common populace. It spread so fast that workers would leave early because they suddenly felt ill and were dead by the next day. The virus was so deadly that people died faster than the bodies could be disposed of. Imagine going to the grocery store to get your weekly vegetables, only to see that everyone inside the store was coughing and vomiting. And then imagine that everyone who left that grocery store went home that night and died in their beds. Word quickly spread that a plague was there, and every sane person stayed inside. Almost immediately, the grocery store that provided food for the population shut down, either because all of the staff were dead or they feared catching the plague themselves. And once the markets shut down, there was nowhere for the peasants to get their food. And this compounded the effects of the plague even further. The entire economy came to a halt as any person who caught the plague was almost guaranteed a horrific death. The death toll was so bad that there were more bodies lying in the streets than there were places to keep them. No one knew how or why the plague spread, but they did know it was contagious. The economy ground to a complete halt and the population collapsed. Almost half of the entire population of Europe died because of the plague, 
And what's worse is that all the trade and global economics cease to exist. I strongly agree with the presumption that the Justinian plague prevented the Roman Empire from ever uniting again. Justinian himself caught the plague. And for a while it was thought that the emperor had died, but he did manage to recover from the horrible disease and continued to rule over the Roman Empire. Unfortunately, the population was devastated, and there was nothing Justinian could have done to defend the empire from such an assault. Despite all of his campaigns and progress in law and religion, it was a virus that put an end to his dreams of a united Roman Empire. This disease spread through every single port in the Mediterranean Sea and into Britain, Northern Europe, and even into the Persian Empire. Even though Justinian survived the plague, and so did many people within the empire, the damage done was fatal. Trade was almost halted, and skilled workers were almost lost. Following this, the trade economy ceased, and the empire was fatally wounded. With the loss of gold, trade, labor, and population, the empire would have completely collapsed. But the plague spread east and infected the Persian Empire with the same veracity that it hit the Roman Empire with. The two superpowers of the known world were completely wiped out of their trade income, their taxable population, as well as their military force. Now the effects of the disease wrought on the two superpowers of the Middle East was so even that they both should have carried on and continued like they had for a thousand years before. But they never expected a force from the wild frontier to become such a threat. The Persian Empire and the Roman Empire continued to feud over their frontier border and never took into consideration that their barbarian neighbors to the south would be able to take advantage of their current weakened state. For the next couple of decades, the Roman Empire under Justinian continued its expansion, but without the population to fill the military, there was no way to continue the campaign into Western Europe. Justinian was able to rule successfully over the empire, but his ability to mobilize soldiers was diminished. In 542, Khosrow invaded Anatolia and marched upon Belisarius. However, Belisarius managed to trick the Persian king into thinking his army was quite larger than it really was. Khosrow backed off. However, when word made it to Belisarius that the plague had taken Justinian, he refused to listen to Theodore's orders and created a divide among the two. She stripped Belisarius of his rank and title and confiscated all of his possessions. Back in Italy, an Ostrogothic army led by the new king Totila engaged a larger Roman army at the Battle of Faventia. What makes this battle interesting is the fact that the Ostrogoths, who were outnumbered, challenged the Roman army to single combat. Any Roman soldier could volunteer. When the Ostrogothic warrior met the Roman soldier in battle, he was killed. And the war started anyway. However, the Ostrogoths managed to win the battle and scattered the Roman army. In 543, King Totila marched upon the Romans with his army, intent on taking back the lands he lost in the previous Gothic wars. However, by now, most of his army had died from the plague and he was never confident enough to take all of his survivors and throw them into battle against the Romans. So the army kind of waited in the countryside. Even the Roman commanders who held all the major cities were hesitant to engage in battle. And the entire Roman army remained behind the city walls, unwilling to engage the Ostrogoths. This allowed the Gothic army to roam the countryside of Italy all the way south to Naples, even taking the city for themselves and holding on to the bulk of the Italian peninsula, minus the major cities. The Ostrogothic strategy changes at this time as they start to negotiate with the local Italian population, urging them to surrender peacefully in exchange for fair treatment. The Ostrogoths were even known to feed the people of the city once they surrendered peacefully. This was in stark contrast to the Byzantine Romans who charged hefty prices for their grain, reducing the poor to as Procopius described, eating bran, nettles, dogs, mice, and finally each other's dung. The Pope saw the desperation and fled to Syracuse, where he organized grain shipments for the cities still held by the Byzantines. However, these grain shipments were all intercepted by the Ostrogoths. 
In 544, after Justinian recovered from the plague, Belisarius was given back his rank and title and sent back to Italy to rally the troops and take back the lands lost to the Ostrogoths. He landed in Italy and traveled straight to Rome, where the Roman armies consolidated and prepared to engage the Goths. However, the commanders weren't always cooperating with Belisarius, and it led to the breakdown of his army. When the Ostrogoths marched on Rome, they faced a very weakened and disorganized Byzantine military. On December 17, 546 CE, Totila finally entered the city of Rome after his men used ladders in the night to climb over the walls and open the gates for the army. They looted the entire city and took what little the people had left. And to see that Rome could never be used as a military fortress again, they tore down over 75% of the city walls. In 547, Belisarius returned to the ruined city of Rome and ordered his men to rebuild the walls. They were by far effective stonemasons, and all they ended up doing was piling up the large stones into a rough wall of rocks that surrounded the city. But when King Totila returned with his men, he was astonished to see how quickly they rebuilt the walls, despite them being nothing more than piled up stone. In any order, the walls held, and the Romans were able to repel the Ostrogothic army. In 548, Belisarius retired from the Italian peninsula and sailed back to the capital of Constantinople. In 549, with their commander gone, the city walls in ruin, and no one having enough food or any pay, the Byzantine soldiers abandoned the ruined city of Rome, and once again the Ostrogothic king Totila marched in and occupied the once eternal city. In 550, Justinian sent another army, this time commanded by Narsus, and marched several thousands of troops across the Balkans and down into Italy, where they set up a major camp in the middle of the Ostrogothic kingdom. With almost 10,000 Roman soldiers, about half of the archers, they formed up on the high ground and waited for the Goths to attack. When Totila and his army approached the hill, they once again challenged the Romans to single combat, and once again the Roman soldier killed the Ostrogothic warrior. When Totila gave the order to charge up the hill, the Roman center held strong. They were the shield wall and spearmen, and their job was to brace for impact. However, the flanks of the Roman line were filled with thousands of archers, and they rained arrows down on the Ostrogoths as they charged up the hill. By the time the armies clashed, both of the Ostrogothic flanks had fallen completely to the archers, and found themselves alone against the strong iron shield wall of the Romans. When the archers turned their attention to the Gothic center, the attack collapsed and any surviving Gothic soldier ran back down the hill to escape the arrows. Seeing the Goths retreating down the hill, Narsus ordered his entire cavalry charge, and they galloped down the hill, killing every last one of the Goths as they desperately tried to make it down the hill. 6,000 Goths, including King Totila himself, died on the hill that day. With such a decisive victory, Narsus was able to sweep all the way down the Italian peninsula, and take back all the cities captured by the Ostrogoths, and even manage to kill the last Ostrogothic king, ending their kingdom in Italy forever. Unfortunately for Narsus, the last act the Ostrogothic king had done before getting himself killed was to send a message to the Franks, pleading for help against the Romans. It would take a couple of years, but the Franks would answer the call. Silk which was first produced sometime during the 4th millennium BC by the Chinese, was a valuable trade commodity along the Silk Road. In fact, that's where it got its name. By the 1st century AD, there was a steady flow of silk into the Roman Empire. With the rise of the Sassanids and the subsequent Roman-Persian Wars, importing silk to Europe became increasingly difficult and expensive. The Persians strictly controlled trade in their territory and would suspend trade in times of war. Consequently, 
the Byzantine Emperor Justinian tried creating alternative trade routes to Sogdiana, which at the time had become a major silk producing center. One to the north via Crimea and one to the south via Ethiopia. However, the failure of these efforts led Justinian to look elsewhere. In 551 CE, two unidentified monks, most likely members of the Nestorian church who had been preaching Christianity in India, made their way to China. While they were in China, they observed the intricate methods for raising silkworms and producing silk. This was a key development, as the Byzantines had previously thought silk was made in India. In 552, the two monks sought out Justinian. In return for his generous but unknown promises, the monks agreed to acquire silkworms from China. They most likely traveled a northern route along the Black Sea, taking them through the Transcaucasus and the Caspian Sea. Since adult silkworms are rather fragile and have to be constantly kept at an ideal temperature lest they perish, they use their contacts in Sogdiana to smuggle out silkworm eggs or very young larvae instead, which they hid within their bamboo canes. Mulberry bushes, which are required for silkworms, were either given to the monks or already imported into the Byzantine Empire. All in all, it is estimated that the entire expedition lasted two years. In early 553, the Franks crossed the Alps with an army of over 35,000 men. They captured the city of Parma, and with their presence, every Goth in northern Italy flocked to their side. It was still winter, and Narcissus kept his soldiers in their camp and let the Goths rampage down the peninsula. However, this worked out for Narcissus as it allowed his troops to rest and gather their strength while the Goths were busy raiding the countryside, depleting their food stores. To Narcissus' luck, the Ostrogoths divide their armies up, making them smaller and easier targets. One of those armies managed to capture the plague, and it wiped out the entire Gothic army, leaving one smaller force in southern Italy to deal with. The last Frankish camp settled along the river in a flat plain and created a defensive wall around their camp by lining up all of their carts up to create a physical barrier. They even constructed a large watchtower that could see far away and spot any Roman armies that might be advancing through the valley. However, Narsa sent a few cavalry to charge the cart walls, breaking many apart and setting fire to others. Once the cavalry had broken into the camp, they made a dash for the watchtower and set it on fire before galloping away from the camp and joining the main Roman army. After the initial skirmish, the two armies marched onto the plains and formed up for battle. The Franks had their back to the river, with nowhere to retreat, while the Romans formed up in a narrow valley between two mountains, making it impossible to get around their flanks. The Franks saw this and decided to form the entire army into a wedge and charge all at once across the plains. This wedge charged through the endless arrows and managed to punch a hole right through the Roman center. As much as this initial charge worked for the Goths, it now exposed their entire flanks to the archers, perched up on the hills, and they rained arrows down onto the Frankish army, managing to circle around and prevent them from escaping back to the river. With chaos now erupting within the main Frankish line, the Roman center that had been pushed back now regrouped and charged head first, spear up into the Frankish army. Several Franks managed to sneak out of the enclosure before it was too late, and they fled back to the river, most of them drowning as they tried to swim across. It is recorded that only five men out of the 20,000 army survived the battle. In 555, Justinian's general had officially reclaimed the Italian peninsula. It was a glorious victory of the Eastern Roman Empire, the once bustling and populous peninsula of Italy was now a war-ravaged, depopulated wasteland, but at least it was back in the empire. It would take over a thousand years for the Italian peninsula to recover from the Gothic Wars, but for now, it was back in the hands of the emperor. After suffering from the plague, Justinian continued to live for another 20 years. While he continued his construction projects and campaigns into the western provinces, 
but the strength of the Roman Empire was now stripped away. The Roman Empire's entire world had suffered the plague, and it seemed as if it would pass, and everything would get back to normal. This is very easy for me to say, as I have never lived through such a catastrophe. However, the Romans were persistent and continued with their expansion under Emperor Justinian. The plague had wiped out so many people equally across the known world that everyone sort of remained on the same equal playing field as they had before. The Roman Empire still had dominance in the Mediterranean Sea, and the Persian Empire still dominated the spice trade and silk road from the Middle East. So when the rulers got into a confrontation like they did dozens of times before in the past, it seemed like just another conflict between old nemesis. However, these two superpowers were about to learn that the loss of so many people and trade networks was more than just devastating to the state economy. It was also fatal to the world economy that had been established in the previous era. Justinian is known for almost reuniting the Roman Empire, but there was nothing he could have done to prevent the Black Plague from preventing the plague. If you look at a map of the Byzantine Empire at its height, you will see the borders created by Justinian. Some people refer to him as the first Byzantine emperor, and others refer to him as the last Roman emperor. No matter how you look at it, Justinian came the closest to reuniting the Western and Eastern empires. The only thing that stopped him was an act of God that devastated all of humanity. There was one common denominator within the plague. That was the fact that people who never lived in or near cities were spared the fate of those who did. Without black rats, there was no way to catch the plague. And there were certain tribes of people in the deserts who were completely spared the horrors of Justinian's plague. In 565, Justinian passed away, only a few months after the Empress Theodora. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. See you next time. Stay safe and stay awesome.